here. Welcome to Metropolis. I hope you're having a great time so far. And um, both of you, I think we'll start with Jesse. Um, if, uh, you want to tell us basically how you got started on Supergirl? Like, what was the process? You originally thought you were auditioning for someone else, right? That's right. Um, well, I I knew I was auditioning for Supergirl. I was familiar with the show. I watched a bunch of Arrowverse shows at that point already. Um, the character I was auditioning for was someone named. Uh, it was like a play on the name Reed Richards. It was like Ryan Richards or something like that. And I, I had no idea it was for Brainiac 5. I saw it and I said, oh man, they're ripping off Reed Richards. This is like a one-off character. He was the smartest guy in the world. And so I wasn't trying to do Brainy or anything. In fact, I didn't really do the character that I do on the show. I just played the scene. And, uh, and then I only found out two days, I think, before shooting who I was playing. Uh, I, I, I flew in on the, the Thursday to do the makeup test, and the day before that, I did a wardrobe test, and that's when I found out who, who I was shooting, because they, I saw a picture, and they introduced me to the rest of the wardrobe people as, hey, this is Jesse, he's playing Brainiac 5. And I was like, uh, what? I, I play who? I knew who the character was, but no one had told me. And I found out later, Robert Rovner, our showrunner, he he just had forgotten to tell me. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Something important to tell yeah, you, oh, exactly. by the way, you're playing this person. So um, it was, I was very present, pleasantly surprised. I was familiar with the character. I never in a million years thought I would be playing him or that I was right for him. Um, but uh, in, in looking back, it was the perfect person for me to play because uh, I never thought I could play a superhero, but if I was going to play one, it would have been the most nerdiest one out there who is a guy filled with uh, you know, a bunch of useless knowledge and information that rubs people the wrong way. So uh, it, all, it all worked out for the best. And Nicole, what about you? What was the process of finding your character on Supergirl? Yeah, I mean, for me, I was... I had just finished my third semester of college in, in Maine, and I filmed it as a self-tape in my parents' basement with my best friend Lexi, and I didn't hear anything for a while, so we just assumed, because that's how it goes, you do an audition, you don't hear about it, and you're like, well, I guess it wasn't mine. Um, so then I went out to Los Angeles to do this like indie vampire movie called Bit that I love. Hey! Um, and while we were out there, um, they asked us if I could send in another self-tape. And my agent said, no, there's no need. She's in Los Angeles right now. So I went in the room and I auditioned for our showrunners, Robert and Jessica, and our executive producer, Sarah. And the next day, I got the part. I didn't have to like chem chemistry test with anybody. I didn't read with anybody. It was They just wanted you. You were so good. I mean, I just, and, God, could you blame them? <laughs> <laughs> and they made the right choice. Yeah, so, and then I, so I finished um, filming bit, and then the next thing I knew I was in Vancouver. I dropped out of college, because um, I was like, well, do I finish my studio art degree at this engineering and computer science state school with no art program, or do I be a superhero? No, it's a choice. And sometimes being a superhero just has to happen, right? <laughs> that felt like the easy choice. Right, right. Yeah, and when it comes to superheroes, obviously, like, hair, makeup, costumes, bombastic things are part of the game, right? Like, so you both had to do some pretty intense hair and makeup and costume stuff. Um, what's the hardest part of, I guess, kind of getting into character when that much technical stuff is involved? And do you have any crazy hair and costume stories, either one of you? I mean, coming Mine from probably the, speaks for itself. I right? yeah, from the crazy makeup. costume hair and makeup guy himself. I mean, but you probably took just as long to get your makeup on as I did, right? Um, no, yeah, <laughs> totally. Well, they had a, there was a lot of spackle over sandpaper situation. That's right, yeah, the so. hammer and chisel. Exactly. Um, they had to rebuild me from the ground up. Yeah, well, I, people always ask how long it takes to put the makeup on it. We got it down to a science. Um, and by the fourth, fifth time, we became a well-oiled machine. Um, and so the, our, our best time, I think, was two and a half hours. Um, but what people don't understand is that taking the makeup off is just as hard as putting it on. So, you know, these humans, when they're done work, they just get into a car and they go home. 
and they're at home with a beer watching TV and I'm still at work with a hammer and chisel trying to get this prosthetic forehead off my head. So it took just as long to take off. Um, and I was very resentful of that. Well, it didn't help that we would also send you selfies from home. <laughs> Go ahead. I would be the first at work and the last one to leave every day. No, and I was just thinking just the physicality of just playing a superhero on a weekly series and what your body has to go through because you have to look good in the suits because I'm pretty sure, I don't know how many fittings or how many alterations you guys have to do, but you guys are still people. How much do you have to train and all that stuff in order to get in those costumes? Each? I was very fortunate um, because I Dreamer didn't involve a lot of athleticism or physicality. Um, you'll notice in all of those fights I was often towards the back going pew, pew, pew. Um, so that was, that was a lot easier than what some of the others had to do. Um, but then I would go, I'd go home and, and like a crazy person in the mirror be like practicing like dream choreography. And yeah, even getting the hand gestures down, that has oh, to be a yeah. whole process figuring that well, out. Well, you know, it was just I remember when, the, when we were figuring out your, your dream hang stuff. Oh, yeah, because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And then you came up with like this really cool, like, under the arm thing. I just remember you trying out a bunch of different things, and I was like, no, that's no, not good. No, 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 no. No, no. Yeah. Well, that, that could be good. Yeah. <laughs> you were like, stop. You look like, you look ridiculous. What you want to do is. <laughs> um, for me, I think, you know, I, I just tried to eat moderately healthy and, and you know, I, I, you know, Brainy isn't the big hulking guy. I should say Jesse isn't the big hulking guy. You know, I was just, you know, malnourished and that's how I kept my skinny physique. In the fifth, sixth season, I, the suit started getting a little tight. Um, but for me, it was, it was all about posture and, um, I had a device that was like this elastic band type thing that I would wear around my shoulders that would keep myself straight and like train my back to have this like upright posture. And so I, you know, I basically had like th three or four poses that I would cycle between. I would have my hand triangle. Yeah. I would have my like, you yeah, know, yep, yep. fist behind the ring. back. Yeah, yeah, and the behind the back. Which was funny, because when Sam, there was a scene in season four where um, Brainy uses his image inducer to look like Sam Witwer's Ben Lockwood. Ben Lockwood for a scene. And so Sam got to play me playing him, right? Which is like Sam's dream. Um, so, uh, you know, I, what I did was I sent Sam a video of, recorded of myself doing the scene. And I just hammed it up in the video. I'm like doing my hand thing on this line and on this line I put my hand behind my back and I, oh you should say, when she says, uh, wow that worked out, you tell her, obviously, walk forward, but then forget that she's there and then bring her back. Yeah. Like I just <laughs> mapped out the blocking for how to play Brainy, right? And so, you know, we shot the scene and Sam just did this great impression of me doing him. And he told me it was very unnerving because behind the camera all he could see was this little blue alien peeking his head over the camera <laughs> to make sure that he was doing it correctly. Um, but that was like, like oh, cut, cut, <laughs> cut. What was that? That was a lot of fun for me, like to see someone doing an impression of me in the show. Oh, and having them do the brain, or the brainy voice. The brainy yeah. voice too. Because there's a certain how you do that voice. Yeah, so... I had to explain the reason, because he's like, why do you talk like that? <laughs> <laughs> I had to explain the reasoning to him. So like my reasoning, so like these characters, these Legion characters were created in like the 60s, right? And so all these names of these superheroes are like Lightning Lad and Lightning Lass. And they have this like real kind of like 60s you know, um... Mid-Atlantic. Yeah, like, this, like, 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 um, yeah, like this, uh, uh, this... Like the old-timey news. This old-timey yeah. kind of way of life, you know, uh, that they had in the 60s. But since these characters are now in the 31st century, my reasoning was, like fashion is cyclical, maybe in the future, this thing kind of comes around again. 
and it becomes hip and cool to have that old kind of mentality. And so maybe they would talk in like what I call a mid-Atlantic accent, which is kind of like the Fraser, maybe kind of Stewie, a little bit of Ron Burgundy. It's like the, I'm not British, but I'm just, I speak the language of I'm smarter than you. <laughs> and so it was that kind of like, raised eyebrow kind of talking. That, uh, that we, uh, and so I mix a little oh. Jeff Goldblum in there, and, 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 uh, and so that, that's, the, well, that's the reason why I talk like that. That's great. All Which right. I fluctuate between, you know? And I thought it was cool, oh, when I'm evil brainy, I can just drop that completely, and people would be like, whoa, this guy's a good actor. <laughs> The reality is I was just stopping overacting, so. Yeah. All right, folks, everybody, first of all, big round of applause to Super, uh, Supergirl Tara over here. Oh big my round God. of applause. <laughs> all right, and Tara, we're ready for some questions. So if you have a question, raise up your hand. Oh, not all at once, guys. All right, here we go. This question is for Jesse. Yes. Uh, what was the the hardest part of playing Brady? The hardest part of playing Brady? You know, I was, I think just stepping onto set that first day, you know, it was, there were big shoes to fill. Anytime you're playing a character that's existed for 70 plus years, it's, it can be very daunting. You know, you, you, you're playing a character that people all over the world have an attachment to and have some sort of connection with. You don't want to, upset them in any way, you want to do the character justice, so it was, um, it was just that initial first day was, was very scary. That first scene I stressed out over more than any scene. I think I can still remember all the lines from it because I ran them in my hotel room a thousand times. Um, and I, you know, I was a fan of everyone, like Melissa and, and Kyler. I, I knew them before and I knew what pros they were. So I knew I needed to bring my A game in order to go toe for toe with him. Um, is that an expression, toe for toe? Toe to toe. Toe to toe. <laughs> so, um, You've combined toe to toe with eye for an eye. There you and go. created something truly awful. There you go. I've hashtagged that thing right now, man, jeez. Toe for toe. So I went all 10 toes with him. And, um, so went all 11 toes. Wait, what? You all no. have 11 toes, well, right? Yeah. Um, Jesse, Jesse, I just want to know that you yes. know that um, I told you this before about my high school students. Um, yes. Some of my really um, uh, readers are now reading comics because of all my Brady talk. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm a big fan of uh, comics, as you know, and uh, I love that. You know, I don't get books without pictures. What are you supposed to just like imagine? You imagine things? How do you know what color hair they have? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. What a great crowd. So my question is for both of you. Do you have a favorite scene or episode that you filmed? I mean, my favorite is a combination to time travel episodes that we did where we went back to Midvale in 2008. That was really fun because we just got to do full tilt stupidity and ridiculousness. And it's great because Jesse has such good comedic timing and comedic instinct, and I think I know my way around a joke. <laughs> and so we got to just keep trying, I think, to one-up each other and to go higher and higher. And it was so stupid, and it was really fun to do. Yeah, it was nice to like, it was almost as if we had our own show for a minute. Yeah. You know, it was so cool to just have an episode alone with, I want to say her name's Nicole. So it was great. It was a lot of fun. You know, I- It's Brittany! <laughs> I, I saw that script and I saw the baseball scene and I got really excited. We, we saw that, um, we got the script like two weeks before we shot it. Um, and I saw, okay, base, and it said in the script, Brady plays baseball very weirdly or something like very vague. And I said, okay, obviously he's the greatest baseball player to ever play the game, accidentally, you know? So um, I knew about that bat flip 
in the bat flip trick where you like go to swing a bat and then you flip it and catch it in the same swing. And I'd seen people do it. I had never done it before. Um, I immediately, after reading the script, went to our props team and asked them, do you have a bat I could take home? He said, sure, because they have everything. He gave me a bat and then for the next two weeks, I went, I walked everywhere with a baseball bat. And I just tried over and over and over again to do this bat Every flip. Every store he went into thought they were being robbed. I, yeah. <laughs> no one messed with me in, in Vancouver. I was the most dangerous person on the street at all times. Um, I, but no, the, re the reality is I tried in, in my apartment and knocked over lamps and scared my wife half to death. Um, and I just practiced that move over and over and over again. And I didn't get it right until literally the night before. And oh my God, because it, it's dangerous, you know? And if it hits you, I like messed up my hand. My knuckles were all bl bloody and everything like that. The night before, I found the perfect angle to do it at where I could get it consistently. And then the next day, it was one of the greatest feelings in the world because we shot that baseball scene that team of baseball players, they're like real baseball players. They weren't like just random background. The, that was a real baseball team. They were like the Vancouver Balls. I don't know what their team is. It's like. Pride Month. I don't know why you're looking at me. Sorry. <laughs> Mama, sports? The sports balls. Yeah, the Vancouver sports balls. Yeah, yes, yes, right. Um, they were undefeated. And so I walked up, they were all there on the field, and uh, we walked up to block out the scene, and as I'm walking towards this, like, 30 baseball players, I just whip out the trick, and I do the bat flip in front of them, and there was just this wave and a hush of, fell over the crowd. Of, Whoa, they all made that sound, right? Yeah. It was the greatest feeling I've ever had. Yeah. Uh, they all made this big, like, sound of... They were so impressed, right? I remember you coming into work practicing and like showing us the videos and stuff of your progress and like, you put in the fucking... And so uh, they, they make this... <laughs> Sorry. Oh my. Get a dog in the swear jar. Put a dog in the swear jar. Hold on. So they make this big sound of like, they were amazed. And the coach who played the coach of the baseball team was their real life coach. He just kind of pushes through all of them and he gets to me and he goes, do you play baseball? And I said, absolutely not. And he says, can you hit a ball? And I said, I can hit a CG ball right out of the park. And he said, oh, okay. And I said, listen, I'm an expert at making it look like I'm very good at everything, but I'm actually horrible at most everything. Uh, and so a I- true American inspiration. It was, it was a great feeling. I was on cloud nine, but then the minute we started shooting, I lost all their confidence right away because I went to the plate and I stood on the plate. And the coach is like, sir, you stand next to the plate. And I said, you're right, of course, I know that baseball sports. I was just making sure you knew. Yeah. Like, this is not like hockey at all, guys. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Did I score a goal? I scored in baseball. But yeah, that episode was a lot of fun. All right, Terry, do we have another question? All right, in the back over there. Two questions for both of you. Um, what is one of your dream roles, and who is your favorite comic book character? Where, where, where are you? I can't see you. Oh, there you are. Okay. Oh, I mean, my favorite comic book character, I mean, now is Dreamer, who has made her legendary debut in the DC <laughs> And I guess a dream girl kind of gets encompassed in all of that as well. Um, I am a big fan of Storm. I really love, um, grew up loving her, loving X-Men, Mystique, um, Rogue. Just, I love X-Men. Um, call me gay, I love X-Men. <laughs> um, but I think my, my dream character would be to do Star Wars and to do yeah! something else. On that audition, snatched bald, ready to go. That would be really fun. I love her. I loved her in the Clone Wars series. I'm such a fan of like a good villain, and I haven't gotten to play like a real villain yet, and I really want to. Yeah, um, I want to be a pirate. <laughs> I want to be a cowboy and a pirate. 
Cowboy pirate. Cowboy pirate in space. In space pirate boy. Yes. An eye patch. Yeah. Um, I uh, I've been telling people that you know I've been painted white and blue and green at this point. I'd like to be painted red. <laughs> so whoever will have me. <laughs> Star Trek society sci-fi show. If you need a, a painted guy, I'm, I've kind of cornered that market. Just round out that rainbow. Yeah. Well, it's re it's really important. To, I mean, he's an ally. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's really important to find a niche and and dig yourself in there. And I think you've done that. Here. Very, yeah. very expertly. Um, my favorite comic book character, since we're in this uh, metropolis, I'm gonna go DC. And uh, I'm gonna say, um, yeah, because I know, just read the room, all right? Okay, well, Moon Knight is right there, so if you're gonna come for me, he's gonna defend me. <laughs> um, my favorite has always been uh, uh, Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing, I've always been a huge fan of Swamp Thing. You guys like Swamp Thing? Have you ever Swamp Thing? It's dope. Look, I'll sell you on Swamp Thing right now, okay? Guy named Alec. I know Swamp Thing is dope. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I'm gonna sell I want to talk about Swamp Thing, is that cool? <laughs> Who's Swamp Thing, Jesse? <laughs> okay, guy named Alec Holland, right? Am I getting that right? He's in the, the forest, he's, he's a scientist. He figures out how to uh, transfer information through osmosis. So he takes an, uh, a worm, he teaches it how to go through a maze, he kills that worm, feeds it to another worm, that new worm now knows how to go through that maze. Oh, damn. Right? All of a sudden, his, his science experiment is sabotaged, a d dynamite goes up, blows up, oh, damn. it explodes, his whole thing, his, his, his chemicals and everything explode, he goes Word. flying into a swamp, right? No cap? No cap, ma'am. Now, Alec Holland dies in that moment, right? But the swamp is mixed with his body and all the chemicals from his experiment. Now the swamp remembers what it feels like to have ribs, so it builds ribs out of wood and branches. It remembers what it feels like to have lungs, so it builds lungs out of plants and vegetation. It forms this human-like creature. This monstrosity emerges from the swamp, and he's looking for his love, Abigail, right? He just wants to find her and tell her that he's okay. But what he comes to realize is not, all he wants is just to turn back to Alec again and be human and be with his love, but what he realizes is that not only will he never be able to be human again, but he never was human in the first place. He's just a plant that thinks it's a human. It's an examination of the human condition. It's mind bending. It's beautiful. It's poetry. It's Alan Warren's Ladies and gentlemen, Jesse Rapp. I think he's all set up on Swamp Thing. Ladies and gentlemen, what, Brittany was her name? <laughs> that was quite the journey, man. I, I, I buckled in. I was like, I was in for it. Now I gotta go. Like That's fair. All right, Tara, do we have another question? So this, this question's for Nicole. Alright, my voice is... How was it like bringing your transition to the screen and making it relatable to masses? I'm sorry, say that one more time? How was it like bringing your transition to the screen and making it relatable to the masses? Ooh, I mean... It, I, it was scary, uh, the transition to the screen. Um, I think because when I joined the show, I had not really had any on-screen acting experience. I had done, of course, this indie movie and one guest appearance on like a medical drama, Royal Pains. So I was completely green, new, did not know what anything was. I was like, you want me to hit a mark? Like with what, my aunt? Like I did not know what anything was. Still can't hit a mark, by the way. Um, and it was a learning process and it was such a learning curve. Um, and terrifying being this, you know, college dropout, like, I was the youngest one on the cast. I felt like I was like just like this little kid who was like invited to the legendary grown-ups table. And they're like, hey, yeah, you who has never done this before, do you want to do like this really emotionally taxing scene with legendary stage actor David Harewood and try to keep up? And I was like, look, man, it's your show. <laughs> yeah. 
if you think this is how you want to sink this ship, uh, be my guest. But, um, but I was very fortunate to have folks like Jesse around me and, and people who were very patient with me and, and who I was very fortunate enough to, to get to learn from um, and form friendships with. <laughs> I'll say one, can I say one thing? Yeah. I, I'm s still so impressed with how fast, you were like the real life flash. You were so fast at, at learning. You quickly, like you said, started off as a novice, became better than so many of the actors I know. Thank it was so much. impressive seeing how fast, you learned in one season what it took me 15 years to learn. <laughs> and I was blown away by it, and everyone was. And uh, yeah, much. it was really impressive. say one thing about David Harewood. My goal on Supergirl every day was to make David Harewood laugh. His uh, laughter is in, in the best. I just, that was my goal. I just wanted to make David Harewood laugh. And we just had so much fun with David. He's like the most fun to work with. And I don't care. He, he won't care if I tell you. This guy never knows his lines, right? <laughs> but he's like a Shakespearean actor. He's so good. But he doesn't, he doesn't know. And I would just die of laughter when I'm seeing him say his lines, because I know that he has no idea what he's saying, right? But he has such confidence. So, and he has this like, scat, this like smolder that he does. So he would, the confidence of which he would walk into a scene, hit his mark, and ask for the line. Line! Was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. And so this, was, this is how it'd go. Yes. Go like this. So he would enter the scene like this. Line. <laughs> you kill me. That was photorealistic. That was, it felt like I was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the demonstration. Did you have another question in the crowd, Tara? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, how did it feel, how nervous were you? I mean, I mean you mentioned somebody, you know, but how nervous were you to be the first transgender uh, Superhero, period. I mean, I was like, really nervous, man. You nailed it too. You nailed it too. I was scared. I'm not gonna lie. I mean, you were from like stage acting, right? I mean, I, was, I read your IMDb as clear. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as that. But then you come on, not only the first time on screen, but the first time yeah. transgender role on the screen. Yeah, I mean, the pressure was on. And, 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 and similarly to what Jesse was saying about like portraying a character who had a history of 70 plus years in the comic books and, and you want to do justice to that, I think alternatively taking, uh, being of course the first transgender live action superhero on television, but then this brand new character that I had to, okay now we're, she's amongst all of these fan favorites and now I have to somehow carve out this character that people will hopefully like just as much, um, and and so for me, every scene was like life or death stakes, and when I would and, and and part of the learning curve for me too was learning how to interact with social media and how to navigate that and and how not to internalize all of that because when I would see scenes um, come out, of course, any actors. <laughs> can't watch themselves, and I would, and, and I, don't, I don't, maybe you can. I cannot, I will tear myself apart systematically. Um, but I remember doing, in season four, there was a scene where Nia and Brainiac kissed for the first time, and it's like, you know, ooh, ooh, ooh. I have never wanted like a live studio audience more than in that moment. I, I wished and prayed that there was been a ooh. <laughs> no, but I, I went on social media later and I was getting a lot of people coming at me because they were like, Mia didn't ask for consent. And she was like, she assaulted him. And I was in a panic. 
I was like, oh my God, how could I have done this? Like, I've just sunk this character. Like, oh my God, I, and like, I did not know what to do with it. And I did not know where to put that information. And I was beside myself. And because and every wrong, any wrong move, I was like, that's gonna be it. That, they're gonna say no more trans superheroes, no more dreamer, we tried it, that's done. Um, and so every scene was like, and then eventually I, I, I gave up on that. I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna have fun. I'm just gonna, cause she's a cool character and she's awesome. And thank you very much. So sometimes there's like real life couples that go on the screen and to have zero chemistry with each other. How did you guys build your chemistry? I don't think it's people? very nice to talk about Melissa and Chris that Oh way. my god! <laughs> oh, shots fired! Uh, uh, redacted. <laughs> no, no, but, but you know what I mean. Sometimes it's tough yeah. building a chemistry with a romantic partner in real life, but much less on the screen and make it believable. Because like I said, you see a couple of like, no, I don't buy this at all. But you guys build something together on screen that I'm like, too, too cute. What's that like? But how did, how did that work out just between you two? Honestly, it's not something you plan or do anything. I was, I feel like Nicole had to do all the heavy lifting in that relationship. I was more like just my eyes were backwards into my own head staring at the ceiling. I can't be with you anymore, Neil, yeah. because future and also intellect. Yeah, she's like, but hey, but like, what? you know, she really had to do the heavy lifting there. And, you know, it's not something you can even really manufacture, it just either works or it doesn't work, and we were lucky that it worked. I remember when we were shooting that first pizza scene, the director came up and was like, you know, you guys have great chemistry. And I was like, okay, I guess so. I mean, I don't, like, I'm doing the same thing I always do. So, you know, it just... I'm like, this is my second episode. I am just yeah. doing my best. It just sometimes the camera will like you for some yeah. reason. Yeah. And, and, and it was just fun getting to, you know, do those scenes. Because, you know, like I said earlier, he, Jesse has great comedic timing. And, and these were just two really funny, fun characters. And, and getting to explore that relationship and, and do those scenes with Jesse. There's no one else I would have rather done them with. You know, comedy is all about... Timing. 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 And finishing, finishing each other's... Sandwiches. Yeah. <laughs> Our mental synchronization. Tara, did anyone else have questions? Hello, I'm Steve Lesby. From What's up? Kansas City, Missouri. Woo! Woo! I was a no-brainer. I had a good night's sleep, but I got your autograph. It was a no-brainer for me and told you to have sweet dreams. Man, See you are a there. pro. A king of marketing, if I've ever seen one. Jesse? Yes? Uh, could you tell us about your character, Riddick, by he never met Riddick, his father. Yep. That would have been interesting on the series Supergirl. Could you? Yeah. Could you tell us why it didn't happen? I think it probably had to do with rights of like what characters what characters we were allowed to use uh, on our show i know that like um uh krypton had rights they were at one point doing like gonna do a metropolis tv show and they had reserved some characters there was the movies, a lot of like red tape yeah so it, it all had to do with like what characters we were allowed to use brainiac 5 luckily we were allowed to use um, I always wanted Vril Docs to be on the show, and I had all these casting plans for it. You know, I had a list of people I would have loved to play my father. Uh, I would I thought um, Naveen Andrews, who played Saeed in Lost, I thought he would be an awesome Vril Docs. I thought Brent Spiner, who played Data in Star Trek, would have been another awesome... So Brent was supposed to play the president in season four on our show, but then something happened with scheduling. He had like a family emergency, and then Bruce Boxleiter ended up playing that role on our show. Um, who's, who's awesome, we're really lucky we got him too. Um, so I was like, oh man, so Brent is free to maybe play my dad, you know, so. Um, and then I also thought Tony Curran, who played my father in Defiance, 
I thought he would have been a perfect. We have such great chemistry already. He ended up playing a character in The Flash, the dude with the fin on his head. He was like a villain. Um, I was hoping he could have played my father at some point. So I had big, I had big grand dreams of, of parent casting, but that didn't end up happening. But who knows, you know, maybe in 20 years, if we do this again, I can play my own father. <laughs> you know? My own grandpa, yes. How I met my grandpa. Uh, what the hell, Sticko? Tell us about your process of getting into your dreamer costume. Oh, I mean, the dreamer costume. Spanx. So, that part. Spanx. Well, for the first two years, I also had a corset on. Um, which was very disappointing too, because I had two um, gray sides on my costume um, that went over my waist, and they were really stiff material, um, but they were detachable because they wanted to leave room open to like have harnesses and have somewhere for wires to go. If they ever wanted to put me on wires, they never did. But it covered any of the waste that the corset gave me. <laughs> so it was complete, so just two years of being like snatch waste and then we ditched it in season six, because I was like, look, if you guys aren't gonna, if we're not gonna see it, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but the suit was in two pieces. There was a full body suit, and they had sold it to me on this like, oh, it's gonna be great, it has a zipper down the front, if you need to go to the bathroom, if you need to take it off yourself, great, and I was like, awesome. And the second part was the vest that would go over it, and it was so small, and it would pull everything back, and I could only really wear it for maybe 10 minutes at a time before just the pain set in. And so cut to me on hour three, and they still haven't taken me out of it. And they're like, hey, how are you doing? And I was like, I wish I was dead. <laughs> but that, I could not take off myself. It had a very intricate zipper process of like two different zippers going diagonally in different directions. And so they sold it to me. I'm like, oh yeah, you can take it off yourself. And I couldn't. And I'd just be trapped, needing to pee, in excruciating back pain. Like, somebody please come release me. <laughs> oh my god. And those suits don't breathe, either. That material, it doesn't keep you warm, it doesn't keep you cold, it just keeps you uncomfortable no matter what temperature it's in. But damn does it look good. But god, damn does it look good. No. As, as somebody that's taken pens and post-it notes from work constantly, how hard is it not to keep some of that cool stuff at your job, man? Just like, hey, this is cool. Let me take it home. Oh, this is cool. Let me it's take it home. It's not that hard. I've taken a lot of things, actually. <laughs> yeah, what's specific? I Kryptonite, right? I have uh, some kryptonite. Um, and it was like a cool piece that has a button on the bottom that like glows. So I have some kryptonite from our show. I have some crystals from the Fortress of Solitude. I have... Um, I have my like uh, light bulb chest wow. nipple things. Yeah. That was the best line ever. Can I just say, Jesse adds this great line um, when the witch, one of the like Kryptonian witches, has taken over his body, and she's like, "What does? What are these? His nipples?" And it was. Yeah, that one was. And we, everyone lost their minds. Um, I that have I have the crown, Brady's crown. I have. I have this, the Legion ring. I, I do have a piece of the suit as well. I have my, like, yeah, they, yeah. They gave it to me in like a folded thing. Bastards. I have also like my outfit, like the brainy black outfit. Oh, I, have, I have like some dresses that yeah. Mia's worn and I have like shoes that I've taken with me. Um, I have the gloves. They let me, cause they had so many pairs of gloves. Cause sometimes the, her little like switch was, was like her dream energy emitter. Um, it had, um, LEDs in it, so we could turn them on, and there'd be like a little blue glow on my hands, and the, they would go out all the time. So we just had a ton of pairs of gloves that we could just cycle through. Of, oh, these are off, or oh, the thing came out, or oh, switch gloves. So I have a pair of those at home um, in costume pieces. But that's I don't have a lot of like suit stuff. Yeah, I wanted to keep, I wish they'd let me keep the suit. Cause I was like, girl, my TikTok game would have been fire. The back game would be worth it for those TikToks, right? I mean, come on now. All right, is there someone else here? First, I wanna thank you both for coming to Metropolis. We've oh, enjoyed- thank you for having us. Everything and uh, I believe laughter makes the world go around and 
I would like to know what types of tricks you played on each other on the set. The best ones. Uh, but PG them. <laughs> I have nightmares. Uh, so when Jesse turned green, he had gloves that would keep his hand, he, he knows what I'm gonna say. He had green gloves on and the sweat would like build They were up. like fake hands. They weren't like gloves, right? They were gloves yeah. to make it look like- Like he had hands Like they on. had like, yeah. they were like rubbery, fake green fake hands. Fake hands, so he didn't have to paint his hands all the time. And they would like build up with like hand sweat inside of them. And he would, he would come up behind me and he'd go, Squish, squish. Oh, don't act like you're not impressed. It, it was awful. It was cruel. I filed several complaints with our HR department, and there was no repercussions. They asked me at the end, they were like, do you want to keep the, the hands? And I said, no, those are gross. <laughs> they smell like an old hockey bag. It was disgusting. <laughs> Looks like there's another question. My question is for Nicole. Um, I know when y'all ended Supergirl, which I love the series, I love it. How did it feel, or how did it transaction of Flash, the show Flash, because I was like excited when I saw you show, it was, a, it was a surprise to see you play your role again. How did you feel about it? I was so excited. Um, so that came about, I, John Cryer, um, who played Lex Luthor, was being awarded at the Saturn Awards for like best TV villain. And he had asked me if I would like to present the award to him. Um, so I said yes, and I was there. And so at our table uh, was Eric Wallace, who's the showrunner of The Flash. And as soon as I sat down at the table, he didn't say, the first thing he said was, oh, we need to get you on our show. And I was like, yeah, man, like, totally. Um, so, we, and we, so we talked about that, and then I didn't hear anything from him for a while, and we had a Zoom call and like an hour and a half, and he just was like, tell me about Dreamer, what are her powers, what do, what do you think she's doing after Supergirl, like, what, tell me everything. Um, and then, yeah, I was, I was up in Vancouver filming Yellow Jackets, and, and uh, yeah, and I had an episode off, um, which just perfectly corresponded with um, the episode that he wanted to bring me in for. So I got to go, and they both filmed in Vancouver, so it was great, and it all worked out perfectly. But it was really, really fun, because I got to run around with Candace, who I adore, and, and she and I had been doing like press together, and we'd done iHeartRadio, and we'd done South by Southwest, and so we were great friends, and we'd never gotten the chance to work together on the shows before. So that was a really great opportunity. And then Brandon and Grant, we'd have this great scene in um, in the coffee shop where like, we're doing our own thing, like dream realm, panic, like, oh, we're, we're, we're going into the oversleep. We have, you know, fevers if we don't wake up and, you know, if the clock's counting down. Meanwhile, Grant and Brandon are like doing like a buddy, like comedy duo in like the barista, like, flipping coffee and burning hands, and they were doing a whole like type five routine back there. It was hilarious. <laughs> I was gonna ask, um, I know Nicole, obviously you've written Dreamer now, as well as played Dreamer. Um, how much creative influence do both of you have on your characters in the show? And were there any uh, things that you wanted to happen for your characters that haven't seen yet that might show up in a comic book or um, I know Jesse you were talking about not having someone play your dad and that would have been cool Were there any other things that you were kind of hoping for your characters that didn't come to pass that maybe fans can look forward to in the future? I mean, I um, I don't know, you know, I was I, I got to do a lot of cool things I obviously wanted to, to do scenes with my parents and stuff like that, and, but um you know, a lot of the things I asked for right off the bat ended up coming to fruition, which is very cool. Like when I first, in season three, when I went to the writer's room, I said, look, you know, if we ever do a crisis on infinite earths, we need to do a council of brainies. You know, there needs to be like five brainies. And ultimately we ended up doing that. And they asked me to write down all the different types of characters I wanted to play. So I wrote character breakdowns for Brainy Prime, I did Ernest Brainy, I did 
uh, at the time he was called Soccer Mom Brainy. Um, uh, I did, uh, you know, the Evil Brainy, and uh, was there another one? There was, and then and the, my, my sister. Oh yeah, my sister. sister. And that was another thing. I, I pitched right away. I was like, look, I have a sister. Maybe because they had just done an episode where all the women had had to go on a mission together, and I said maybe there's somehow we can get my sister to play me and go on this mission, or you know. So I wanted my sister involved in it somehow. That came to fruition. Um, so yeah, like a lot of cool things that I, I talked about in the beginning ended up coming, ended up happening. So it was it was pretty cool. But, you know, Robert and Jessica are showrunners. We were very lucky to work with them because they had, they, you know, they were very open and gave us a real sense of ownership over our characters. And they, they trusted us, and which is something you don't really get a lot on TV shows. The door was always open for, exactly. for questions and yeah. pitches. And so, you know, much to their chagrin, at like three in the morning, they get emails from me explaining why Brainy can't shoot a laser beam out of his ring, you know? And I have to write an essay on like, this ring is a tool for exploration and discovery. It's not a weapon, okay? He, it can make him fly and use telekinesis, but I refuse to have lasers shoot out of them. Lasers out of the ring are where I draw the line. So it was, it was really awesome to have bosses like that, that. Can you please tell them about the pitch that you gave uh, for Evil Brainy? Do you remember the one? Where you die? Yes. <laughs> and I loved it. It was. I was so into it. They're like, you need to stop pitching that Nicole dies in the show. I'm like, yeah, but she's not really dead. Yeah, totally. <laughs> well, in the comic, Dream, uh, Dream Girl dies in the yeah. comic, but then becomes like a vision that only Brainy could see. Yeah. And so I. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I was yeah. so down. I, I was like, yeah. yes, let's do like. I forget what project. I exactly what I, what I pitched. Okay, but... well I remember it yeah. almost <laughs> word for word. So it was gonna be like a really cool like season finale like cliffhanger. We were gonna have Dreamer like out fighting crime, doing her thing, being like the moment, and Brainy was gonna come up to her. And she was like, oh, hey, whatever. And so they kiss and have a moment in the alleyway and then shink. And then I stab pan you. Pan down, knife in the stomach, cut to Dreamer bleeding out and in the middle of the street. And then you find out that I was find evil brainy the whole time brainy. and I switched places with the and evil brainy. And the good brainy is trapped in the And the good the brainy bottle. was actually trapped in the bottle. Yeah. Yeah, that was my pitch. Yeah, and I, um, if the only thing I would have changed was as they pan out, can we just play the end of losing my religion? <laughs> so just, just a But change. I wasn't trying to kill you off. No, you were no, then going to become in a the fan we in every episode. The, the, yeah, it and was then ultimately be so cool. the journey back to you getting your body. Totally. But I, I, oh, and it could have been great. It could have been you talking to me. Everyone's looking at you, and I'm like, oh, they can't see me. Which you we did crazy. do ultimately, right? Like, because you were the, the yeah, astral right, projection. Right, we did. Yeah. Um, I also pitched that I would die in the show. I was like, all right, hear me out. I get killed. And they were like, we've never had anyone pitch their own death on the show before. No, you're just like Thanos, just wanting to kill half of everybody. <laughs> so my, my, my pitch was, so there's an episode of Legion of Superheroes, the cartoon that I always loved, where they go to this fun house type place where each Legion member is confronted with their worst fear. And, you know, so-and-so is afraid of heights, and so they have to confront their fear of that. So-and-so is afraid of whatever, you know. And when it gets to Superman's fear, um, Brainy dies, right? And he basically realizes that his, you know, biggest fear is losing someone that he loves, right? And so my pitch to the show was that we do something like that, like I get killed and she has to, Supergirl, has to come back with my dead body, and they all mourn the loss of Brainy. And then the next episode, they have to contact the Legion of Superheroes and let them know that your valued member is Yo, dead. Yo, what up? Your boy is dead. <laughs> it wasn't us. And then the Legion would come back and say, oh, that's too bad. Well, who has the backup disc? <laughs> and then they just put the backup disc in me and I come back to life, but I've like, my memory from the last three episodes is gone. We check Brady's warranty, it's not exactly. quite up. And that, my friends, is why you always hit the save button. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Tara, do we have a question? Wait, Way in the back, look at that. Right. All right. Hello. Uh, First, I just want to say thank you for continuing
continuing on and creating characters for the younger generation to admire and to love. Um, and my question is, who was your, for both of you, who was your fake cast member to film with? Who was it, Jesse? Uh, <laughs> it was, I want to say Nicole is my name. Nicole is my name. Obviously. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was so much fun. And just getting to mess around was a blast. I think our scenes were my favorite. I just really it was great. You know, my favorite were scenes where we were all together because yeah. we, 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 we would have, all got to see especially each other. in the last season, like we would always shoot these big, huge scenes. In the and, tower. And it sometimes it would be so fun. Like we would just crack up laughing. Like I always had a lot of fun shooting with Lena, like scenes with Lena and with David too, and with Melissa and Kyler. We, I'm just naming off the entire cast. Now. Yeah, it's just, well, because that's the yeah. thing. We were very, very fortunate of having, I think, one of the best casts. They were, everyone was spectacular. I mean, it, the crew as well. We had such a great on-set environment that it was always amazing getting to go to work and get to play around with those guys. Um, I miss it a lot, but it was Season so four, fun. I had like a lot of scenes with, with Alex. And so Kyler and I would have so much fun shooting these, it was such a fun relationship, the two of them. So season four was me with Alex and then me with you. And so that season was a lot of fun. I always loved, I ne we never really got to work together, but one of my best friends was uh, Staz, who played William Day. And there was this one scene where it's him and me and Melissa and Katie, and we're all in the tower. And I like, and they're like fighting, so I'm like leading him away. And we go into like this little back room, and everyone had to come and tell us to be quiet multiple times because we like we just kept like messing with each other. <laughs> Exactly. It was you got like the two class clowns like sitting in the back like of the room. Quiet down, together. kids. No, fully, one hundred percent. It was so fun. Also, you know, my sister got to be on the show, and that was fun. And my wife got to be on the show too. She in the final season, Holly played Doctor Beatrice Lar. She was like the weather yeah. scientist that accidentally destroys the world. Or yeah. Something like that. So yeah, that was very cool. Turns out me. the world is very easy to almost destroy. Yeah. <laughs> Every weekend. Every Wednesday. Every week, yeah. Excuse you, it was Sundays. Oh, sorry. Uh, All right, did you have another question of Craig Carroll? Uh, hi there. So the series ends with uh, Dreamer and Rainy together, and because Dream Girl exists way in the future, we can assume that they had kids, so I'm almost scared to ask, but what would Brainy be like as a dad, do you think? <laughs> and the question for both getting an answer. What would you think Brainy would be like trying to raise kids? Probably like like super attentive to a fault. I feel like he is PTA dad. <laughs> right? Like Paul Thomas Anderson? What's PTA? Parent Teacher Association. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. Ah, there you go. Um, yeah, I, I can't say So you're saying you. he would be super Canadian, is that what you're saying, right? <laughs> Nice, polite, and yeah. attentive. So. Oh, oh, I, feel like yeah. he, I feel like he's like extracurriculars, like violin lesson, baseball, drama club, choir. Like. Time and action sheet for everything they do, oh, yeah. So. But probably like borderline abusive too, like just throwing him into the ocean and be like, you have to figure it out yourself. Like well, I was the smartest guy on my planet when I was four years old, right? By far, I mean, they were all like, what, eight, nine level intellects, and that was a 12th. So, you know, I probably has a lot of high That is fourth level intellect behavior, and I know you can do better than that. Get that from your mother. <laughs> Mia was very smart. I'll have you know she skipped a grade. She was the smartest third level intellect I'd ever known. <laughs> and then she captured my heart with her dumb, 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 dumb self. <laughs> Um, before we go on, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to do your Arnold Schwarzenegger, but everybody, everybody, you want to hear a Jesse yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger? Yeah. 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 Let me do it one time, because I saw the YouTube clip. All right. I hate to put you um, on the spot, but I totally will. Here, I'll start. Oh, please do it. We all want to see so bad. <laughs> I mean, come on. So Jennifer Coolidge and Arnold, what's the scenario? Give us a, you're picking up a cat. Picking up a cat? You're just picking up a kitty cat. Come on, go pick it up. Oh, 
I don't want to swear, so I'm just gonna... Come on, put that oh. kitty down! <laughs> oh, I'm a cop, you idiot. Put it down, put it down. I'm taking him home with me. He's mine now. Oh. I'm taking the cat, dumbass. I just wonder what a typical day of taking would be. How early you had to be at the set, how many hours, and did you do locations, or was there anything done on the soundstage or scene? Well, that depends on whether or not you had to be painted green. <laughs> Hello, there we go. So like my day, if, if my day, if the, if the day started at seven o'clock in the morning, I had to be there at four in the morning. So, it's brutal, sir. <laughs> and I'd roll up around anywhere between 8, 15, and 9. <laughs> no, I mean, it varied. Like, sometimes we were on location, sometimes we weren't. Um, it really depends on the day and how many scenes you have that day, because sometimes you're in there, you're only doing one scene, and it could be an eighth of a page, and then you're in, you're out by noon, and it's great. Other days, you will have four scenes with monologues, three people in it, you have to do everyone's coverage, the wide shot, maybe a special effect shot, uh, close-ups, all that. Um, and that'll take, you know, you can go upwards of 16, 17 hours. Um, but we were very, very fortunate that we did not have something called Friday days, where you would start Friday evening and shoot into Saturday morning at five o'clock, and fortunately we did not have to do that. We did in season three though. Well, I didn't have to do that. <laughs> so. I shot a scene, this is unrelated, sir, but um, <laughs> Melissa and I shot like a fake commercial, like a PSA commercial, and I was painted green in front of a green screen <laughs> behind a plate of green vegetables. <laughs> And somehow it worked out. We all made it. All right, Terry, you have another question out there? Yes, eat your greens, please. Uh, yes, eat your greens. Yes. Uh, season four was one of my probably my favorite season, most partly because of you guys. You definitely brought it to a whole new level. I'm like so happy. Uh, my, I got two questions. Uh, one. Uh, what are you most proud of bringing to the characters in the show? And if you had the chance to jump back into the suit and go through all the trauma, makeup and hair, would you jump back as the heroes? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's evident from The Flash. They asked and I was like, absolutely, yes, let's do it. Uh, do you want to do two? Um, Dreamer is a character that I'll always say yes to. Um, because as, I, as I've sort of said all weekend, I've developed a very unhealthy, perhaps, relationship with the character. Um, but it's okay, I'm in therapy, and I can unpack that as I need to. Um, but I'm very, very proud of Dreamer. Um, I think, honestly, the thing I'm most proud of is, is being able to have shepherded her into the comic books and, and have gotten to write her um, in, in DC Pride and Son of Kal-El and Lazarus Planet and, and all the other stuff that you guys don't know about yet. Um, it's just been really, really fun and very rewarding, and it's one of the things I'm absolutely the most proud of. Do you think, um, because Legion of Superheroes is one of my favorites, right? Like, uh, Brainiac 5 and Dreamer aren't as well known to, like, the general populace as, like, a Superman or whatever. Did you find it to be a benefit that you could kind of put your own spin? Like, especially, I mean, Brainiac 5 has been presented before, but Dreamer, coming from Dream Girl, you kind of had carte blanche. Like, yeah, I mean... Dreamer was really, really fun because it, I did have a lot of blue room and we got to find who that character was. And, and I feel like we went through very, sh she was great because she had so many different levels too. And she's done like the, you know, plucky superhero who's, you know, super, hey, take it down to like seven. You're threatening murder a lot. Um, to then when she's on her revenge spree and she's like, no, I know I'm, I'm not threatening murder. I'm promising murder. Um, that was really fun. Um, so it was it was really fun and really rewarding, and there was so much room to get to explore with her and and, and develop like her comedy and 
develop her romantic life and and just all aspects of her character and it's yeah I adore her um, so I'd say so my I guess proudest thing about the character is, I'd say is uh, so I'm obsessed with comic book accuracy right and it's a big point of contention with my character, especially when I started the show, looking the way I looked, right? You know, people know Brainy as, as a green-skinned guy with, with, with the blonde hair, and I appeared as a blue-skinned guy with white hair. And so a lot of people were immediately against that. You know, he's had different versions of him throughout, you know, the cartoon and the, the comic. In the cartoon, in the Justice League cartoons and stuff, he was blue and Brainiac was blue in that. And so I felt like we did that, you know, we played homage to that version, but I wanted to, I wanted so badly to be the, the be all end all of the characters so that they could say, look, at this moment they did him perfect. And so I really wanted to make him green. The problem with that initially was that the reason was they didn't want to make me green because they used green screen. Because Supergirl's suit was blue, they couldn't use blue screen. So that's the reason why they made me blue. But the reality was it wasn't a, it wasn't a problem. Technology, like, they could do it. So they wanted to make me green, they just didn't know how to write it into the story. I came to them with the idea that I remove my personality inhibitors First of all, I told them, these things, let's call them persona uh, personality inhibitors. You know, it's what they refer to them in the comics, right? We never talked about it on the show. And I said, that's the reason why I am the way I am. We remove that, it changes my character a little bit. And in doing so, I turn green. And you're kind of retroactively saying, oh, that's what was making him blue this whole time. When my sister came on the show, she had a line, look, you're not even green, you know, like we teased it that that's the reason I was blue. So we remove that, I become green, and all of a sudden I have the long hair from the comics, the long blonde hair. Then I thought, okay, let's get short hair now. I wanna have that classic short hair brainy look, so I got the short hair. Then the suit came, and they wanted initially for me to have a green suit, and I sold them on the purple suit, you know, and I wanted to have the, 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 the personality inhibitors on the chest. So I was very obsessed with it being comic book accurate. And uh, the final- the yellow boots too. The, the yellow with boots? The yeah, with Ernest Brainy, he was like the classic Brainy. I got to do that look with the yellow boots. I had to, these were all battles I had to fight, you know, and that I was ready, prepared to die on those hills. Formation thanks you. And uh, finally, the final episode, the cherry on top for me was, I'm looking at the, the Brian Michael Bendis new Legion books, and I loved the design of the Brainy. He had the crown with the red, you know, cr uh, dots on his forehead. And I had to sell them on that. And f for the final episode, I got the Brainy crown. And so, yeah, I'm most proud of achieving all of those Brainy looks along the way. So it's like, we kind of like tip our hat and pay homage to the character throughout all the different versions of it. Last thing I'll say is, one of the weirdest things about the Brainy character and the whole green versus blue thing is back in the 60s, you know, the printer, when, when they were printing these green, uh, you know, color pages, the printer would mistakenly sometimes mix up green and blue. So accidentally, he'll, he would accidentally have a blue hand sometimes. And he would accidentally have a blue face sometimes in these green, uh, you know, comic books. I think serendipitously that character was then changed to blue for the cartoons. So that scene when I was changing from blue to green, I have a slew of pictures of where I'm ha I have green face, a green hand, and then one blue hand. And it was like we were paying homage to this like printer malfunction from the 60s that kind of tied everything together, and we were like putting it into the canon of our story, so. It, it was kind of like a full circle moment that I thought was great. All right, so we got oh. one more question, we're gonna wrap it up again. Yeah, you can clap it up. Yeah, all your brilliant yeah, activity. Yeah, there ever was one. Yeah, that's awesome, no. It's so cool that you wanted that much invested in your character, man. It just shows your dedication to it. Oh man, that's awesome. All right, one more question, we'll wrap things up. Oh, um, this is for both of you, but if, uh, what is your favorite power that your respective characters have? And then if you could like 
like pick another power from either each other or one of your other cast members to have that their characters have, what would you pick and why? Wait, where are you right now? Right here. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so my favorite thing about my character is that he doesn't have superpowers, you know? I love that about him. He's just super smart and his brain is his superpower and he doesn't need superpowers to be super heroic, you know? He creates a ring that can allow him to do these crazy stuff, but it's not a weapon, it's a tool. And he freely gives that ring to people. He invite, invents the image-inducing technology and he just gives it away to people. Um, you know, I, I just love that about him. He, he has no ego in that sense, but he has an incredible inflated ego in other senses, so that's, that's me. Alternatively, he has no powers, and I have all of them. Um, because I think on the show, whenever we, it, she kind of became like a deus ex machina, wherever like, oh, we kind of were written into a corner. Uh, yeah, no, she pulls a cougar from the dream realm, because of course. Um, and so that was something that was really fun. Every time I'd get a new script and I'd say, oh, I didn't know I could do that. Okay. Um, I think my favorite one that I got to do was, I love the astral projection and we never got to do that a lot. Um, I, my favorite that we didn't, I wish we'd relied on more was her uh, precognitive abilities like as we were fighting there was this great training scene um with jesse and i as we were in the fortress of solitude fighting and it was like differential calculus versus anticipatory dreams and she was like dodging punches left and right and i really wanted more like in these fight scenes to have her like i i was begging I and mean, i never got to but i would beg them like please can i just like fight a room full of guys and just like dodging bullets and punches and like throwing people into someone, throw, someone's throwing a punch behind me and she just, boom, boom. I wanted to do that so bad. And I kind of got to do that a little bit in DC Pride number one um, when she took on the League of Shadows. Uh, but that's something I really Humble wish. Brag. Humble brag. Uh, because if you can't do it on the TV show, you just do it in the comics. Uh, yeah, but um, if, I, if I could add. I don't know, I hesitate to give her any new powers uh, <laughs> because I don't want her to break the universe. Um, because I mean, the way, so when I was first having my conversation with Eric Wallace um, and he was asking me to describe Dreamer's powers, I said, okay, so picture this. Imagine if Wanda Maximoff had been trained as a Black Widow soldier. She was in possession of the Time Stone and was given a Green Lantern ring. You have scratched the surface <laughs> of what Dreamer can do. And then in, and then we went into Superman, Son of Kal-El, and he said, okay, well, what if she could also go into the Dream Realm and use it as a kind of hallway between Dreamers? And I said, why not? You know, why, why, we've given Dreamer so many new powers, why stop there? Uh, I mean, if she could fly, that'd be cool. But I also kind of feel like... <laughs> Her being more of a terrestrial bound hero is kind of the Having only thing. Having rides off a of Supergirl and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. Well, I always wanted Rainy to propose to Neo with a Legion ring. Um, I thought that would have been cute, but. <laughs> All right. Well, our, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, oh no. Everybody, do you have a good time today? Yeah. Have a good time. Yeah. Uh, before we wrap everything up, let me go ahead and introduce. The co-chair of Super Anne Celebration, Miss Carla Argo. Everybody give her a big round of applause. Thank you. I hope everybody is having a great time this weekend. Yes? No? Yes? All right. So we really appreciate everybody coming out and supporting our, our celebration. And you know, we got that one thing in common. We all love Superman. Well, there's, you know, Batman and all the other guys. You know, that's fine. Yeah, well, yeah. But, so we have a special thing that uh, it is an honor. An honor that we give out uh, occasionally to people who we think is just amazing. So I have a couple of awards for Nicole and Jesse. This, this is the only place that you can get this award. We don't give it to just anybody. So display it proudly. But we have a Superman of Metropolis award, and we have one.
for Nicole and then Jesse. I just want to say something. Um, look, you know, this, this symbol that we all have on our chests right now, it's like the most, one of the most recognizable symbols in the entire world. If not the most. And, you know, it was a symbol, symbol for our show. And that symbol, it was like a blessing and a curse for us. It, right away people knew exactly what we were. And no matter who you are, everyone had some sort of connection with Superman. Whether it be good or bad, everyone has their own kind of ownership over the character. So there was a lot of people who didn't watch our show who would look at us and say, well, that's not my Superman or Supergirl. And to come here to Metropolis and to meet all of you guys and to have you guys all be so generous and so welcoming to us, it's really been a very humbling and, and, and fantastic feeling for us. Uh, it, it really feels like we're home right now, so really thank you so much.